So uh, welcome Genevieve and Stacy and Jessica and Alex and Sammy and Greer and uh, Fralio. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, yes, let, me, hmm, let me share my desktop and talk about what we're doing today. Okay, so the plan today, today's a really big, important day. Um, it could literally change your lives for the better, um, but we'll see. Uh, it depends on whether you listen or not. Um, I'll start with Q&A, and that, that won't change your lives, but you'll be able to ask questions and I'll help you out. And then, um, then we'll do an example, a sampling experiment that I'm going to have you all do, and uh, I'll show you the instructions in a bit. And then after that, um, we're gonna talk about the sample, the population and the sampling statistics. And for every, for the mean standard deviation, for each of those, there's a different symbol and you have to get the symbol straight. Very important in this class is to get the key symbol straight. And today we're gonna to go over, we've already done six of them and now we're gonna do three new ones today. And then comes the most important theorem of all of statistics. Okay, undeniably, and that's called the central limit theorem. And what it does, it allows us to do statistics. Without it, the, the, this class wouldn't be taught. You couldn't do it. Everything would just be guesswork. And that's not what, you know, science is all about, including social science, is that you want to make sure that you're not just doing guesswork, that, that you really can come up with predictions and ideas. And the central limit theorem is the theorem that allows us to do that. And you may not understand how important it is for another few weeks. So because today we're doing the theorem and then we'll be using it for the rest of the entire course. Um, then I have a, in my opinion, probably for all of you, um, if you listen carefully, um, most important application of your life, okay? and possibly the most important application of your life for any course that you take. And that is, how do you make sure that you have enough money in life? <laughs> That's pretty kind of important. So I'm gonna talk about investment strategies and how statistics can be, you know, should be used, not can, but should be used to truly understand how you should be investing your money. And I know some of you, you know, are fresh college students, you don't have any money yet but you will once you're out of college, hopefully, and then you'll start investing and you could either do it wisely or not wisely. And I'm gonna talk about some wisdom. Then we'll get into the central limit theorem for proportions and sums. And then um, after that, we have this, the exam is this week. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time, um, not the whole time, but I'm gonna spend some time talking about the exam uh, the exam's written, I've written the key, um, and you have choices, and I'll talk about all the details that you need to do to get prepared and what to expect for the exam. So that is the plan of the day. And let me ask you, are there any questions about anything other than the exam? The exam will do later. Any questions? All right, while you're thinking, just note, um, uh, yeah, projects were due last night. So uh, I saw a lot of projects were turned in. Today, I'm, I'm teaching my classes. I also graded your um, discussion post assignments this morning. If you notice, very early morning, I woke up at 3.30 this morning, got a lot done. Um, and then my plan is tomorrow, I'm gonna spend most of the day grading projects because today I'm busy teaching, but tomorrow is when I'll, the, tomorrow, and it could be the next day, but definitely, but by Wednesday, I should have the projects graded. It takes me time because it's a lot of pages each and I have to write comments. And a couple things to note, and that is if you're the one that posted the project um, in the grade book, then, um, and I'll put a note on the projects, but I write comments right on the project so please um, share the comments with your partners. So whatever it takes, um, I'm gonna let you guys talk it over, but 
share the comments with your partners so that they get to hear it and see it. And that'll be directly, directly on your paper once I've graded it will be a lot of comments about what could be improved on mostly. So make sure you do share that, okay? The comments that I put in the comment box, that, the, that actually can get sent to everyone, but the comments on the paper itself, I can only give on the paper and you're the only one that could see the paper if you submitted it. And if you didn't, then you need to ask your partner, please show it to me. Any questions? Okay, I have a, um, uh, you know, I didn't do, I didn't do chat, there we go. I have a question for you or a task for you might be a better word for it. And that is the following. I want to pick something that shouldn't take too long, but it'll get you going. So I want you to pick four songs that you like. Could be your four favorite songs, whatever they might be. Oh, and hopefully you have some songs you like. And then I want you to, um, you can go online. If you type the song, it'll give you a length. You know, if you even type in song with the, the title of the song with the length. Um, I want you to find the length in seconds for each of these four songs. Then I want you to find the mean for the lengths of the songs. So it's not really for each, but for the lengths. And then I want you to post that mean in the chat box. So you have a task. Don't spend too much time on it because we have a lot to do today. So you should be going online right now, going and finding out how long the songs are that you love, whatever that might be. You don't have to tell anyone what the songs are if it's personal, um, but the length shouldn't be, the average length of the four songs should not be a personal thing. I'm sure that nobody is gonna like laugh at you because of your length of four minutes and 22 seconds. <laughs> or I guess that would be uh, 244 seconds. <laughs> okay, and you can use a calculator, definitely use a computer to find length. It'll be hard not to. And post in the chat box when you have come up with the mean of those four song links. Okay. And I'm going to put it up here too. So 215.5. Two, two and everyone needs to do it. I hit it come, 231.75, to 10.5. Actually, I think I can put them with commas. It'll make it easier later. Ha, okay, 220 point, uh, it can't be two, I doubt it's 220.1, because if you divide by four, you're either gonna get a 0 0.25, a 0 0.5, or a, just a zero at the end. So that, I, and most of the time they won't do fractional sections, seconds when you report a song. So 218, but I'll write it down anyway, 220. Point one. Uh, 240.218.5. We have 188, oh, multiple of four. 220.5, yeah, that's more believable. Except I wrote the five in the wrong spot. 220.5. Okay, so what we have here and 260.5 is we have data. 
Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven data values. And I think that might be everyone. I, it's hard for me to keep track on who's popping in as I'm not watching, but that might be everyone. Um, so we have data. Now, each of these data values is not the length of a song. Each of these data values is the average length of four songs that were, I'm gonna pretend randomly selected, okay? So what we wanna look at is we have a new data set and it's a data set of averages. Any questions on that idea? And when you have a data set of averages, and I'm gonna do this, whenever you have a list of numbers that is a new data set, you can conduct statistics. Do you all agree? So I can go to my calculator list and I can go to one variable stats calculator, pop the numbers in, and this, these are samples, but that's okay. Later we'll get into the population. And we get a mean of 220.75 and the standard deviation, those are the two numbers I care about, of 22. And in fact, I'll round in the nearest whole number, 221 and 22. So notice that the mean equal 221 and the standard deviation is equal to 22. Any questions? Any questions at all on this little data collection we did? All right, this is different than anything we've done yet because this is a mean of means. Do you notice that? And it's a standard deviation of means. It's not the standard deviation of individual values. It's a standard deviation of means. And it's not the mean of individual values, it's the mean of means, okay? Now, we only collected one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We only collected seven of these guys, seven averages. But how many averages do you think there are? How many averages of four songs do you think there could even be? Any thoughts? I don't expect anyone to know exactly, but in ballpark. Nobody knows? Okay, it turns out there's millions. Oh, can you repeat the question? I was still figuring out my song meme. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I decided I couldn't wait forever, so I just grabbed what I could get. <laughs> um, how many different averages of four songs are there? Oh, yes, so many. Millions, okay. Mm -hmm. It turns out there's millions, um, more than you could ever collect, but you could think of it in theory. Does that make sense? So what we're looking at is we can talk about not just the mean of these seven that I grabbed, but you can look at the mean of all of them of all the possible samples of size four and say, what is the mean of all those possible samples of size four? And similarly, you can say, what is the standard deviation of all possible samples of size four? Any questions on that idea? It's a very important idea. And the distribution, what we call it is a sampling distribution the distribution of all possible sample means is the sampling distribution. Okay, and there's pretty much never a case you can actually get the exact distribution because you know it because the, again, we're talking millions and no one would bother. But you could do it in theory and you can talk about it and it's really important. Any questions on this idea? Okay, so questions? 
All right, so now I wanna do the symbols and talk about the symbols that you have learned. And now we're gonna have some new symbols today. So the first is the symbols for mean. So hopefully you all know that mu is a symbol we use for the mean of the population. Okay, so if, for example, if you look at all possible song lengths and then take an average of those song lengths, that's mu. Any questions on that? X bar is the mean of the sample. So for example, and I don't remember who typed in what, but one of you had an X bar of 215.5. Another one of you had an X bar of 231.75. Any questions on that idea? So there's many, many different X bars from a population. There's only one mu, but there's many, many X bars. But then we got this 221, and then I'm gonna do in theory, you could take the mean of all possible sample means of size four. And the symbol we use for that is mu sub X bar. So mu because it's a population mean, sub x bar because it's a mean of sample means. So mu sub x bar is the mean of the sampling distribution or the mean of all possible samples with a given fixed sample size and maybe all possible sample means with a given fixed sample size. So notice I told you, you all had to pick four songs. So I fixed the sample size to be four for y'all, okay? Once you fix that sample size, there is such a thing as a mu sub x bar. Any questions on any of these symbols that you are responsible for, by the way? Any questions on the idea of any of these? Okay, if there's no questions, then you move on to the standard deviation. Because those are the two, those are the two main statistics for quantitative data is the mean and the standard deviation. So in particular, we're gonna have three kinds of standard deviations. And we have sigma, that one you've seen before, and that's the standard deviation of the population. So if you look at all possible songs of side, of, uh, side length uh, uh, and look at their length, then you could take the standard deviation of that list of lengths. And that's a standard deviation of the population. You call that sigma. And then we use the letter S to talk about the standard deviation of the sample. Okay, I didn't ask you to find your standard deviation, but each of your samples had a standard deviation. So again, there's only one sigma for a population, but there are many, many, many S's because you could take many, many different samples and each sample is gonna have a different S. Any questions so far? Okay, then we're gonna have sigma sub X bar. And that's the population standard deviation of all possible sample means. So as you saw before, we had all these different sample means and we could keep going forever and do millions of them. And we could look at the standard deviation of that list. Now we got 22 because we didn't do them all, but if you do them all, probably wouldn't be that much different. And that would be your sigma sub X bar. So sigma sub X bar, again, is the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. So it's the standard deviation of all possible samples, of all possible sample means, with a given fixed sample size. And we also call it, let me put this in red because it's important. And it's a new word for y'all. Oops, come on. We also call it the standard error. All right, let me highlight it, there we go. So we call it the standard error. 
The standard error is again, the standard deviation of all possible sample sizes. Okay, the standard error is really important because what it tells you is how much one sample mean is gonna vary or likely to vary from another sample mean. And in particular, it's gonna tell you how much the sample means vary from the population mean. Do you want them to vary a lot if you're doing a study or do you want them to not vary much? What do you think? Not very much. Yeah, you don't want them to vary very much because look, you took your sample mean and if you're guaranteed it's really close to the population mean, then you're done, you're happy because you can actually say something about the population, okay? On the other hand, if the standard error is large and you get your sample mean and it's likely to be far from the sample mean and from the, from the population mean, then you don't have a good prediction of the population mean. Any questions on that idea? Can you repeat that one more time? Okay, so the standard error tells you how far the sample mean is likely to deviate from the population mean. So if you take a sample and you take your mean, then that's your best guess for the population mean, right? But if the standard error is really big, it's a terrible guess because you're, you might be very far from the population mean. But if the standard, standard error is very small, it's a really good guess because that means that you're very confident that you're close to that population mean. You see how that works? Yes. So the standard error is the biggie for today, by the way. That, that is, that's why I put it in red. <laughs> and it's also maybe the hardest one to understand, just to be mean, right? <laughs> because it, it, you can't say it in two words, okay? And anyone understand that. I could say standard error, but that wouldn't mean anything. You really have to get at it. And we'll have, we'll have some examples today to, to see how, how important it is. I have a, a quick question. You had put it into a very simple um, explanation by saying it was the difference between the what standard deviation and no, it's the difference between it's a it's not the difference, but it's kind of a likely difference between the sample mean and the population mean. So, for example, the first person. The first person who did this guy found 215.5, right? Is that a good guess on the mean of all songs? And the idea is if the standard error is small, it's a good guess. If the standard error is large, it's a poor guess. So you want the standard error to be small so that you have a good guess. Does that help? But if there were so many different means, does that make it likely that the difference will be large? All right, so you need to be a little patient and I'm talking okay. five minutes <laughs> because this comes the big I'm difference. just trying to keep up with my brain question. Yeah, so we're about to go into the big theorem that, tell, that says what we can do, okay? So I will, I'll answer the question now basically. And that's called the central limit theorem. And it's the biggest theorem of all of statistics by far, okay? I don't think there is any competitors to the central limit theorem in terms of statistics theorems. Maybe law of large numbers, okay? Which is basically the central limit theorem spoken differently. <laughs> so it's really the same theorem. Okay, and here's what the central limit theorem says. And it's gonna take some time to get there. Okay, even though it's not that long, but it takes, takes a lot of thinking. So let's say X is a variable with mean mu. So in our case, X is a variable of how long songs are. Does that make sense? If you randomly pick a song, then X is the length. And the mean length is mu, which whatever that is, it might be, you know, 275 minutes, uh, seconds for all I know. Okay, and let's suppose the standard deviation is sigma. Okay, 
Then, now here comes the biggies. Number one, and they're both really important. The sampling distribution for samples of size N has mu sub X bar equals mu. So that means that the mean of all possible sample means is the population mean, which makes some sense is that if you're looking at all the possible averages, that shouldn't be higher or lower than the average, right? It should be the average. If you take the average of all possible averages, that's the average. But then the next one is one that um, is not something you would ever guess. And that is sigma sub x bar, the standard error. Okay, how likely, so that, that says how far your sample mean is likely to be from the population mean is equal to sigma divided by the square root of n. So I wanna mention something really important. What happens to this if n gets large? What happens to sigma sub x bar? So if n gets large, what's gonna to happen to sigma sub x bar? It gets smaller. Exactly, it gets smaller. So for example, if you take a sample of size 100, then you're reducing the population standard deviation by a factor of 10 because the square root of 100 is 10. So samples of size 100 do a really good job in getting a good prediction. Do you see that? How about if you take a sample of size four, how much do you get to reduce the standard deviation by? Because we did a sample of size four. Shouldn't be too hard. Actually chose four for a reason. So how much do you think the standard deviation is reduced if you have a sample of size four? By two? Yeah, by two, because the square root of four is two. Two squared is four. So a sample size four is still pretty good. I mean, you're reducing that deep standard deviation by a factor of two, which isn't bad. Not nearly as good as a sample size 100. Do you see how that works? So it says that if you want a very predictable sample mean, as in predicting the population mean, then you want a large sample size. And the larger you get for the sample size, the better prediction you're going to have. Okay, then number two. Number two says, if the distribution of X is normal, or, and that the or is the important one because that's what happens most of the time. N is greater than 30. Where have you heard N greater than 30 before in our class? The project. Exactly. And I did that to be as a subliminal message. <laughs> so hopefully you'll remember that number. But if you have quantitative data, only for quantitative data, if you have quantitative data and your N is greater than 30, then the sampling distribution is always normal. And if you have a normal sampling distribution, that means you can do computations because we know we have a normal calculator that I programmed, okay? And lots of other people have done also. If you don't know what the distribution is of the sampling distribution, you're screwed. You can't compute anything. You have no idea. But the central limit theorem says that as long as you have a sample over 30, then you always get an approximately normal distribution. And typically, um, it's not 100%, but typically, when I say approximately, if you're just around a little over 30, like in your projects, that's usually one decimal place of accuracy. Over 100 is typically around two decimal places of accuracy. So, you know, it's not exactly that, but it, it's a good rule of thumb. So the point is, is that most people are good enough with a decimal place. So anyhow, this is the big theorem. So it tells us we actually can do computations it tells us that if we have a large sample size, then our sample mean is likely to be close to the population mean. 
Whereas if you have a small sample size, it may not be very close to the population mean. Um, and of course, sigma is involved too, but you have no control over the sigma, right? The population standard deviation is what it is. You can't change that. What you can change is your sample size by asking more people or getting more songs. Any questions on this, the biggest theorem of the entire class? Any questions? Okay, you ready for my favorite application of the whole course? Okay, and it's an application that has, um, I don't know, probably made $100,000 for me. So maybe you wanna learn this one too, you choose. You know, or you can let someone else make the money and then you give it to them. Sound good? What do you think? Sound like a good application? So here's the application and I'm gonna do three examples. So the first example, if you invest, let's say you have $10,000 to invest and you invest your $10,000 into a bank. And I looked this up this morning, finding out what is the average interest rate for bank savings, it's 0.05%. Okay, and you know, a, a, a decent bank, Bank of America, whatever it might be, El Dorado Savings Bank, you know, there's a lot of different banks, but one of those banks. What is the probability of losing money after a year? This is a very easy question. Zero. Zero. <laughs> because it's called FDIC insured. Have you heard of that? Yes. And in fact, what is the standard deviation for the amount of money you make? It's an easy answer. Based on the current interest rates they're offering? Nothing to do with anything, no. It's much easier than you're trying to make it. Should I tell you? It's zero. I was it's zero. If they told you your interest rate is 0.05%, that's what you're getting, right? At the end of the year, you know what you're getting. If you know exactly what it's going to be, that has a zero standard deviation, right? There's one number at the end and that's not gonna change. Does that make sense? So there's no chance of you losing money. I mean, as long as America doesn't like stop becoming America. <laughs> but I don't think, I, I think we're pretty good about that, you know? I mean, yeah, maybe a comet could hit the earth and you lose everything because everyone on earth dies, but let's hope, I'm not gonna go there, got it? <laughs> so we're, we're assuming that nothing like that happens. Uh, you have zero standard deviation. You have a 100% chance of, of not losing money or 0% chance of losing money, but how much money are you gonna make? Out of $10,000. Five hundred. That's in your dreams, maybe. <laughs> What's point five percent of ten thousand? So that's ten thousand times point zero 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 five. Oh, I did it as five percent, not as point five percent. Yeah, it's five dollars. So you're going to make five dollars guaranteed if you put ten thousand dollars in the bank. Okay. Do you think that five dollars is going to change your life? Not at all, right? Especially if you have $10,000 put in the bank, $5 is nothing. Do you agree? Okay, here comes the next example. The next example is gonna be a lot harder. Okay, now you're gonna invest $10,000, but you're not gonna put it in the bank account. Now you're gonna put it in the stock market. And you're going to randomly select a stock, okay? Now we're gonna assume that the average return is 11%. And I did some online you know, research and that's about what the average return is, not 0.11, but literally 11% is the average annual return in the stock market. And the standard deviation is 18%. What is the probability of losing money? And 
on this one, we can't, we can't answer this question without an assumption. So first, we must assume the um, stock returns are um, normally distributed. Okay, otherwise we can't do any computation. So I want to highlight this word assume because that's an important word. What's the first three letters of that word again? ASS. Exactly. <laughs> Okay. okay. Do you really, that, that, the stocks are not normally distributed, just let you know that, but we're going to assume it for this class. Got it? <laughs> okay. Because um, making an ass out of you and me is what it is actually. So um, to do that, we can, we can add, if we assume the stocks returns are normally distributed, then we can actually do this problem from chapter six. We've already learned how to do this because what we can say is that X tilde N, and now the mean now is, um, I'm gonna go 11, okay, by percent, it's 11%. And the standard deviation is 18. Any questions on that, putting in the symbols? What does it mean to lose money? You all know, but mathematically, it's the probability of what? Negative. Yeah, or even, even easier to say is x is less than zero. If x is less than zero, then you've lost money. Any questions on that? This is backing up, way backing up, but where do I find the tilde sign on the keyboard? Um, it's shift, uh, shift tick is what they call it. Shift little left of the number one, at least my keyboard. I can't say for all keyboards. I see it. Sorry. Okay. I do see it. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> it's a, it's a nice little thing to know. And it, especially by the way, if you're typing in Spanish, because <laughs> Enye has a tilde. <laughs> Just let you know that. Okay. So anyhow, um, we want to find this probability. But because it's normal, we've made that assumption, assume, we can go and say 11, 18, less than zero. So let's go back. Let's go to the normal calculator. The mean was 11, the standard deviation was 18. Any questions on that? Less than zero means anywhere between negative nine, 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 and zero. Any questions on um, this calculation? I hit calculate and I get about 27%. So let's write that in. All right, so you look at that and let's suppose that uh, I'll give you give you my example. Let's suppose that um, you're investing money for your daughter's college education the month she's born. <laughs> okay, so if you have kids, then you know what I'm talking about most important person in the world to you. And the last thing you want to do is lose money and not be able to support her, right? So is do you think this? think 27% is acceptable. What do you think? That'd be great if you could get it every single year. No, 27% means you have a 27% chance of, of losing money. Oh, no, it's not acceptable. <laughs> oh, good, good. I was saying, what kind of mom are you? No, no, no offense. <laughs> if you have a 24-7% of like destroying your daughter's life, you're probably not okay with that. Okay. No. Right? Okay. And, you know, I, I needed to make sure I made money or I wouldn't be able to support her. And I really wanted to support her in college. Okay. And by the way, my daughter did graduate from college and I did support her. Okay. So does that mean I should go back to number one and put it in the bank where I won't lose money? 
Are there any other options? And the answer is yes. So let me explain much wiser decision. And this is number three. And that is if you invest instead of a single stock, invest in a mutual fund. And I'm gonna assume just to make the numbers easy that the mutual fund invests in 50 diversified stocks instead of one stock. Do you see the difference? So if you've never heard of a mutual fund, what they do is they take your money and they invest it in different places so that if one company goes down, you don't lose a lot, okay? Because you have 50 different companies, okay? Um, on the other hand, if all of them go down, that's bad, but we're gonna assume that it's independent, okay? Which is a big assumption, although if you, you know, in my daughter's idea, because that's an 18 year, 17, because she was a November baby, um, but it's a 17 year investment, it's, it gets a lot more diversified. So now what we can do is say, hey, look at this and we can redo our calculation. And now we can not look at mu and sigma anymore because now we're gonna be looking at the average of 50 different diversified stocks. Any questions on that idea? Okay, so if we wanna look at the average of 50 different diversified stocks, then we're not looking at X anymore. We're looking at X bar. So let's go to our distribution. And we can say that X bar is tilde, it's a, and let's go back to more equation. All right, N, now do we need to assume, see for the problem question two, I had to assume that we had a normal distribution. Do I need to assume that we have a normal distribution this time? No. No, and why not? Why not? Because it's a huge variable. Yeah, in particular, 50 is greater than 30. So I'm going to write that in since 50 is greater than 30. The, I'm going to write CLT for central limit theorem guarantees that the distribution is normal. CLT, central limit theorem. Exactly. Okay. It's a lot easier to type. Yeah. Okay, and notice the first three letters of guarantee is not ass. <laughs> so it's being guaranteed is, a, is something you smile about instead of frown about, got it? So this is actually works. Now, the one thing we are assuming is independent. And that's going to be beyond this class to get into all the details of that. So the central limit theorem says that the mean of all possible sample means is the same as the population mean, which we said was 11. Any questions on that? And the standard deviation of all possible sample means is the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. And the standard deviation was 18. So we're gonna take 18. And then we're gonna divide by the square root of N, which was 50. And we still want the probability. Now it's not gonna be X anymore. It's gonna be X bar. is less than zero. Any questions on the difference between my question two and my question three?
Okay, so now I'm going to go back to the calculator. Everything's the same, except what? What's changing now? Of the four numbers I got in there, what's the one thing that, change, that we need to change? Standard deviation. Exactly. We need the standard deviation to be 18 over root 50. So I'm going to put 18 divided by, and then there's a square root button, of 50. So now it's not 18 anymore. It's 2.54558, bunch of numbers. Maybe I'll grab that many put them in the standard deviation box and everything's different. And now we get the pop, the probability. And what do you notice? What do you think? Do you think this is a probability that you could live with in terms of, uh, you know, a, a, a risk? Is this a risk that you would be okay with with your with your daughter's education fund? Like I said, I was not okay with having a twenty seven percent chance of not being able to afford her education. But what is this number? This is one in a 10, 100,000, 10,000, 100. This is, this is like eight in a million chances. That one I'm willing to risk. Do you see the difference? Yes. Okay. Now I'll tell you my own personal history. What do you think I did when she was born? Invested in a mutual fund. Exactly. Okay. And actually multiple, multiple mutual funds. Okay, and do you think that money um, did well? Yes. Yes, yes, it increased by an average, again, actually here, it increased by an average of 11%. 11% is a lot of money, by the way. So we found out with the bank account, you made $5 out of your 10,000, right? What's 11% of 10,000? What do you think 11% of 10,000 is? Right, it's $1,100, 1,100. That's a whole lot more than what you get if you put in a bank account. So if you wanna do, especially a long-term investment, whether it's your daughter's education or your retirement fund, do not invest in a bank. I don't just put it in a bank. You want to invest in something that has a much higher rate of return. And you do want to diversify. Diversified means independent. So you want to invest in all kinds of different things that all have a high rate of return, but could be risky because if it's many things and over the long run, the standard deviation is low because of the central limit theorem. And you'll end up having enough money for retirement. Whereas if you just put the money in the bank, you probably won't have enough money for retirement. Any questions on that idea? This comes right from the central limit theorem. Okay. Okay. I also, by the way, I have what I call play money. That's money that's not like my daughter's education fund. That's $10,000 that if I lose, it's really not going to change my life at all. Does that make sense? How do you think I invest the play money? Also um, mutual funds? <laughs> no, individual stocks. <laughs> I want to make lots of money. Because again, with this, you, you know, you're going to make your 11%. You might make 11.1 or maybe 10.9, but you're not going to make 25%. <laughs> On the other hand, with my play money, sometimes I make a lot of money. Okay. And I've done it long enough that I do real well at it. Um, so sometimes I, I typically make about 100% with my play money but sometimes I lose it all. So I wanna make sure that, you know, it's, it's not something important to me that if I lose it, I'm 
you know, going to go bankrupt or something. So I have a question. Even though the mutual funds typically you make money, I mean, can't you also lose money? So if that's the, the whole thing. If, the, if, if it's a diversified investment over a long term, you probably won't, you won't lose any money. The probability long term, like, like 18, 18 years? years, like 18 okay. years, so like it. retirement funds, child's education fund. The problem is that over the one year, again, this is, you know, it's a bit fictitious because of the word diversified. Mm -hmm. And over the one year, um, you don't have independence. Okay. Um, if one stock goes down, it's more likely another stock's going to go down because the market tends to go down together. Does that make sense? Right. Like what happened at the beginning of COVID, for instance. But there's, a never lot. Been, there's never been a, like a, you know, an 18 year period in my lifetime where there was a negative, where it went negative. Never. Okay. I think from 1929 to 1939, it might've gone down, but that was not, I'm not that old. <laughs> so my lifetime's pretty long, but not that long. So the point is, is that if you, if for long-term investment, it's basically independent. Does that make sense? Okay. So this is an important, like I said, this is important. What do you think happens when you put money into the, into the bank? Like if you go to, you know, Bank of America or something, what do you think they do with your money? They invest it. They invest yeah. it. And they make the 11%. They give you a half a percent. <laughs> and guess what? They smile. <laughs> And that's how it works. They invest it in that. They also invest it in REITs, which means basically they, they loan money to people and make a lot of money that way too for uh, mortgages and stuff. But that's what happens. That, that's why you get so little. And again, you can let them take your money if you want, but it's a bad idea, at least especially for long run. It's much better to invest in uh, mutual funds, that type of thing. Okay, international funds is even more um, diversified. And with REITs, which means um, uh, also has um, real estate because that adds to the diversification. Diversification in statistics is independence, which we've learned about. Any questions on this big theorem and the, this example? It's to me, it's the most important example in your life for the class, okay? Whether it's the most important for like passing this class, I don't know, but but if you pay attention to this, you can, it can change your financial welfare. Okay, now comes the next, quest, the next um, big theorem. And this is a central limit theorem for proportions. So notice what we had just talked about is quantitative data, right? The example of song length, that's a number. The example of stock market return, that's a number. Okay, but a lot of surveys are yes, no questions. And it turns out there's a central limit theorem for proportions when you have yes, no questions. And here's what it says. So if X is a variable from a yes, no question with population proportion P of yes answers, then, okay, and it's gonna be a lot like the central limit theorem that we had before, except now we have proportions, which means we're gonna have to have a mean and a standard deviation and this is how it works. The formulas are messier. The sampling distribution for sample size n has mu sub p hat equals p. So I want to let you know p hat with the little hat on top of it. And the way you say it is p hat. It's easy to, easy to read. That means p with the hat on top means sample proportion. p means population proportion. Okay, by the way, I didn't know why you um, don't use Greek letters like we did for the mean. Anyone know the Greek letter for P? Here's a hint, you all know the Greek letter for P. P. Nope. It's the only Greek letter everyone pi. pretty much knows. Pi. Yeah, pi. And the reason why we don't use that is we used to, when I first taught stats, it was you know, 25 years ago, we used pi. It confused the hell out of everyone because they all wanted to write 3.14. Okay. 
So unfortunately, if you use the Greek letter, it confuses you. So we use this P hat for the sample and we use P for the population. And it's the best, best that could be done. I think it was a good decision. Okay. All right. And sigma sub P hat is a square root of P times one minus P over N. And often the one minus P you use Q for. So Q and one minus P are the same thing. It's just less writing. That's why you, sometimes you'll see square root of PQ over N. And the important thing about this is that notice there's an N in the denominator under the square root. Do y'all see that? So in this case, it's the same idea, is that if you increase the sample size by 100, for example, you're gonna be decreasing the standard error by 10 because it's one over the square root. And that's the, that's the most important thing about the formula. You're not gonna be using the formula like by hand or anything, but I do want you to know that in, in the central limit theorem for means or proportions, in, increasing the sample size decreases the standard error by the square root of what you increase by. Any questions on that idea? Okay, and then number two. Uh, whoops, I made a mistake. I copied and pasted and I shouldn't have. If NP is greater than five and NQ is greater than five, remember Q is one minus B, then the sampling distribution is approximately normal. So I will let you know, this is one of the most common errors on the final exam. If you're asked a yes, no question, don't give me the number 30 because because yes, no questions, we're in the central limit theorem for proportions. And that's about NP and NQ being greater than five. Let you know, and you might know this, but you might not have thought about it. There's a nice way of thinking about NP. So NP is the number of yes answers. And NQ, any guess? Number no. Example, exactly. So if the number of yes answers and the number of no answers are both greater than five, then that means we can use the normal distribution to um, do the calculation. Okay. Notice with number one in both the cases, you didn't need a large sample size. This is just always true. But number two, to have a normal distribution, you have to have a large enough sample size. So in this case, the number of yeses and the number of nos is more than five. Some books use 10, but ours uses five, so I'm using five. Any questions at all on this big theorem? Okay, so here's what I did. Something that it's more out of curiosity than anything else. It's not like important in my life or anything, but I always like to think about what's the world gonna be like in you know a hundred, a couple hundred years. I don't know if you think that way sometimes just for fun. I'll be dead, but you know. But one of the things I've always thought is, are we gonna genetically engineer ourselves? What do you think? We already are in a way, starting to. Um, not really though. I mean, we, we definitely, oh. we, we haven't like fully changed ourselves. I mean, totally. No, changed. I mean, take into consideration the mRNA vaccine. I mean, that's a genetic, that's, uh, that's, that's borderline. That's actually not genetic engineering. We're not, you don't get, you don't change your DNA. My DNA didn't change when I got that shot and, it, and it's not gonna, <laughs> just let you know that. All that did is make your um, antibodies go and because of this MRA come on in. But no, we right, still have but it does DNA. engineer genetics, not, yeah. our, not our own genetics, but yeah. it's- I'm it's talking about our own genetics. Yeah, we're definitely doing it for animals. We've already done that. Um, but so here's the thing. I found under Pew Research, actually, that India stands out as the only place where the majority of adults, 56%, consider gene editing research to be appropriate, okay? And by the way, has, have, we, have we genetically engineered people? The answer is yes. Um, and the guy who did it's in jail. In, and he's in China, 
but yeah, no, it, it happened. <laughs> so we can do it. Um, right now, it's not legal, but that could change in the future. You know, I'm talking. Was it the doctor people. that was doing it with those kids, like the babies? Yeah, yeah, to yeah, keep them yeah. getting AIDS. It was, yeah. it was a really good idea, um, but again, and it worked, but but he went to jail for it. Anyway, so we can do it. But the question is, in India, 56% of their survey, because that's all Pew Research knows, you only know about a survey. Um, hopefully you know, there's a hell of a lot of people in India. Do y'all agree? <laughs> a lot more than America, for example. <laughs> over, over a billion. Over a billion people. You're not going to ask everyone. And that'd be really hard, even harder than Americans. Okay. But the question is, is it really true that over majority consider gene editing research to be appropriate. And the way you think about it is you say, well, if it wasn't the majority, the highest number it could be is 50%. So uh, hopefully you all know the word majority means more than 50%. Do you all know that? That's the definition of majority. So if really only 50% consider gene editing research to be appropriate, what is the probability that a survey of 500 Indians, that at least 56% of them will say it's appropriate? Does that make sense, the question? Okay, so to do this, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use the central limit theorem. And let me scroll a bit. Mu sub p hat is p. So I'm just going to copy and paste this. So I can just type it away. So you don't need it all. I need that much. Okay, took it all anyway. Wait. So your question is, if you changed the fifty-six percent to fifty percent, well, we that don't. We're not changing correct? anything. We don't. We don't know what all in is. Do you see? We don't know what all in no. is because we can't survey them all. But we're going to say, well, let's suppose it wasn't the majority. Oh. Let's suppose it was the highest, but not the majority. So it was exactly 50%. Then what would be the probability of surveying 500 <laughs> Indians and having 56% of them central drawer. say that they think it's appropriate? So the idea is mu sub p hat is now going to be 0.5 because that's our p. Sigma sub p hat is going to be 0.5. <sighs> 1 minus 0. 0.5, which happens to be 0. 0.5, divided by 500. Any questions on that? And we want to find out, we want to see what is the probability that we're going to end up that our P, I'll write P hat, too hard, too hard to type, P hat is at least as big as 56%. Any questions on what, what I'm doing here? All right, well, what I can do is I can go right to the calculator. We'll of course have different numbers, so we want at least 0.56, so 0.56 will be the low. The high, throw a bunch of nines in. The mean was 0.5. That was mu sub p hat. The standard deviation, I have to do some work here. So that was a square root of 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 divided by 500. Any questions on finding the um, standard deviation? I'm sorry, you lost me. How did we get? I'm sorry. So the mean was a 0 0.5. Yeah, because we're assuming, we're saying if the mean was 0.5, if the proportion was 0.5, okay. what would be the probability that you get at least 56% in your survey? 
Okay. So 0.5 is where you put all the P's in the formula because that's what we're saying is that if the proportion was 0.5, well, here we go. Now we're writing 0.5 for P. So now we go to the standard deviation and it's that beautiful boy and empty out the P equals and you get 0.0036. Is that a pretty high probability? What do you think? No. No, it's tiny. Less than 1% chance. So you would say that, you know what? The one assumption we made is right here. Is we said, if it was only 50%, then let's find the probability. Well, that probability is so low that you're gonna say, well, this assumption is probably wrong. Do you see how that works? And I'll let you know that's what we're gonna be doing for the rest of this course. Okay, that, that's why I'm giving, this is like the important um, idea for the last half of this entire class. Okay, just to let you know. So this is a precursor of what we're doing. So if you don't fully understand it, you shouldn't worry today too much. If you don't fully understand it by mid-March, you should worry a lot. Sound fair? I'm just kind of trying to gather my mind around this. Like, okay, if in the study it said 56%, mm -hmm. why did you change it to 50%? Okay, so the article, what, the, the article, see, see, I have in quotes, the article used the word majority. But the question is, we don't know all Indians, right? We don't, they only know the 500 people they asked. Do you see how that works? Mm -hmm. So the thing is, if you ask 500 and you got 56%, are you convinced that you got the majority of all, that the majority of all people from India think that um, gene editing research is appropriate? And this is kind of how the argument goes. And we're going to be doing this argument over and over and over again for many weeks. So this is the argument of the whole class. So if you don't understand it today, don't be worried, too worried. But if you heard it for the 50th time and you still don't understand it, because we're only doing one time now, then you should get worried. Does that make sense? So the argument is, if we want to say, is it reasonable to say the majority, when we got the 56% for our sample, is it reasonable to say the majority of all Indians when we only know about our sample? And the idea is using this central limit theorem, we're able to show that if it wasn't the majority, that it would be so unlikely to get what we got in our sample that it's probably the majority. Do you see how that works, kind of? Um, so the formula for that is the mean P hat. What's that? The formula for that is this mu P hat and Equal. then the equals. Yeah, so let me show you. There's the formula. Right. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Here's I wrote it down, but I'm kind of. And I literally copied and pasted the formula and then I changed the P's to 0.5s. Because you knew it, right? Because, yeah, because that's what the question's stating. That's where the word majority is coming in. And the word majority refers to 0.5. Okay, I do wanna move on though. We have a little more to talk about. I don't think I'll have time for a full example of this, but I wanna let you know that sometimes you're more interested in the sum of the numbers than the average of the numbers. Okay, when do you think you'd be more interested in the sum than the average? Can you think of any example in the real world? And there are some, can you think of any? Maybe positions where you're dealing with actual numbers like accounting or banking. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna say business. Yeah. Okay. So in business, let's say you let's say you own a little small store. And do you care about the total amount of money that you got by the end of the day, or do you care about the average per person? What do you think is more important to you as the owner? Total. Of the, the total. So if you're if you're talking about business, sums are usually more important. 
Does that make total sense? Because you care about what came in by the end of the day, not how much everyone spent on average. So sometimes sums are important. Uh, most of what we'll do in this class though, will not be sums. Most, will, most of the time we'll do averages. But once in a while, sums are more important. And if you remember the formula for average is you add them all up and you divide by how many there were, right? Do you remember that from sixth grade, I think? <laughs> so the different, the, if you have the average you want to turn into a sum, you need to get rid of the denominator and you do that by multiplying by N. So, and uh, have you guys seen the, this symbol? Not in our class you haven't, but in other classes. Yes. Yeah, and it's capital sigma. It's a little frustrating, there's lowercase sigma, which is this guy. <laughs> and then there's capital sigma, which is this one. And capital sigma, what does capital sigma mean in math? Sum. Sum, so that's why I use sum. So the mean sum will be N times the population mean. And the standard deviation of all the possible sums will be sigma times the square root of n. Okay, and the reason why this works, by the way, is that um, sigma sub x bar with sigma over root n, if you take sigma over root n and multiply by n, you get sigma times root n, a little basic algebra. So any questions on the central limit theorem for sums? Okay, and then if the distribution is normal or if n is greater than 30, the sampling distribution is approximately normal. So same as the um, central limit theorem for means. Any questions on this idea? Okay, I, I only have so much time because I try not to go too much over an hour and a half. I try to go around an hour and a half and it's already 12, 13. And I wanna make sure we have time to talk about the exam. Do you agree that that's important? So what should I do next? These things are not on the exam, this current exam. Right, right. it will be on exam two. It will be on exam two though. <laughs> so don't just say, oh, I never need to know this. But yeah, this will not no, be on I'm, this exam. I'm just trying to not confuse myself. It will, it will not be on this week's exam, uh, but it will be on the assignment for the week. You know, regular homework stuff for um, chapter seven. But yeah, no, it, will not, it won't be on exam one. And that's because um, some of you are taking exam one on Thursday. And the assignment's not due till Sunday, and I don't think that'd be fair to give you problems on an exam where you may not even done the assignment yet. Sound reasonable? Okay, so the next thing I wanna do is a secret word. And the secret word for this week is sampling, because the central limit theorem is all about the sampling distribution. Any questions, which is different than the sample. It's a sampling distribution. Okay, so now comes the exam. Because we got about 15 minutes. I try if I can not to go past 12.15, if I, I mean, uh, 12.30, but if I go a little bit past, I'm, I'll do what I do. I'm teaching at one, a different class. Okay, so the first thing is the exam. Um, I'm giving you three choices. And this is something I told you about on the orientation. So you've known about this and I'm not changing it because I told you on the orientation and I don't like to um, you know, promise something and then take it away. So you can, you can choose to take it this Thursday at 6 p.m. You could choose to take it this Saturday at 8 a.m. Or you can choose to take it this Sunday at 11 a.m. Okay, the exam is a two hour exam. I have a feeling if you go to Canvas, it'll tell you Thursday at eight, Saturday at 10 and Sunday at one. It will. Huh? It will. Yeah, and the reason is it tells you when it's over, not when it starts. Okay. And that's just Canvas. I can't, I don't, I can't really do much about that. But what I can do is in the webinar, I can do this. I could highlight it, tell you, this is when we're starting the exam. Got it? 
So very important that you, you must take one of the exams. Okay, basically, if you don't take one of these exams, um, you, you didn't pass this class. Okay, you, it, it's a big part of the grade and exams are important. There's only three exams in the whole class, including the final. Okay, just to note is that, um, again, we're in weird times right now. So yeah, the, the exam is two hours. Okay, oh, by the way, if you have um, a disability and you got your, you have accommodations and you need some special accommodations, then you need to let me know what day you're taking the exam so that I can set it up special for you, okay? So if you went to our Disability Resource Center and they gave you accommodations, they let me know of them also. But if I don't know what day it is, I don't know when to give you the accommodations. So hopefully that makes sense. So all you do is send me an email saying, um, you know, I get accommodations and I'll have gotten the accommodations from DRC. And then, um, then I'll, and then say what day you're taking the exam. And let's say you get three hours instead of two because of some disability accommodation. You have to tell me what time you're gonna start. And the idea is you have to be taking it in the two hours. So Thursday, six to eight. So if you got three hours, you can start at five or you can start at six. If you start at five, it's over at eight. If you start at six, it's over at nine. Okay, just let you know for accommodations. Um, the, the test, we're in weird times. Um, you're not, we're not taking it in a classroom. Even with online classes, by the way, I typically have you go to a library and take it and the librarian will give you the test. But we can't do that because of COVID, unfortunately. Okay. And because of that, we have to do it on the computer. There's no choice. So you will be using a computer, not a smartphone, by the way. Smartphones don't work for the exam. And we're going to use Proctorio, which is the proctoring software for um, computer given exams that, that, that our college uses and the whole state uses actually. So I put a Proctorio quiz um, for last week, I believe, and hopefully you all did it. Did anyone do it? Yes. And did it work? Yes. Good. And was it, was it the easiest quiz you've ever taken in terms of answering the questions? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And Are we still able to do that? Because I was yep. working a ton last week. Yep. And in fact, I set the quiz so you could take it. Let's suppose you took it last week and then your computer like fell into the toilet and, you know, and you can't use it anymore and you got a new computer. Then you can take it again. So the Proctorio quiz, I, I think I set it as a hundred times or some ridiculous number of times. So you can take the Proctorio quiz as many times as you want, um, whenever you want, um, but you want to take it so you can make sure that your computer works with Proctorio because not all computers do. Um, some of the things you're going to have to do is you're going to have to, and there's Proctorio has some links and stuff, but you're going to have to make sure that you're using Google Chrome and that you have the, um, the browser plugin and just link to that from Proctorio. Is there any sample quiz or any type of yeah, indication? There's a, the, I, I made No, no, a, no, a not Proct for Proctorio, for the actual quiz. Is there some sort of outline ah. so or that, direction? Right, notice if you, if you look at the screen right now, do you see what it says right after exam? Number one. <laughs> so yeah, now I'm going through the sample. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Uh, you tried to take it last night and it said it became locked Sunday at six. Hmm. All right, I'll have to look at that and see if anything changed. So um, send me an email, let me know, just so I, so I, so I don't forget, because I'm gonna be teaching the class right after this one. So it won't happen until my office hours. Um, hopefully I don't forget by then because my brain is busy when I'm teaching, just let you know. So send me an email and then I'll, I'll check up on it and see if there's any weird setting in, involved that I can I'll do. try again right after this lecture. It was, I was waiting until after I submitted the project to do the quiz just because I was focused on the project and I went on at like 6.30 and it said that it got locked at six. Huh. Okay, maybe I had to set a time and that was when I set it. Mm -hmm. But I don't think I set a time. Okay, so maybe Proctor locked it. 
But let me go through because the other question was, what's the exam going to be? So here's the exam. Um, question number one, I copied word from word from the exam. And I really hope you all can do this. And this is write your name below if you agree not to communicate with any adults and not use any other devices or materials for this exam that have not already been expressly allowed by your instructor. So a couple things, first thing, my definition of adult is post-pubescent, got it? Okay, and the reason for that is that if you have a child that's say eight years old and they need you, then you need to be a parent. If you have a child that's 14 or 15 and they need you, then you can just say, yeah, wait two hours, I'll help you. Sound fair? <laughs> and you tell them ahead of time, don't bother me. Okay, but a child is different. If you need to breastfeed or whatever you're doing, then you do what you have to do. Does that make sense with a, with a small child? So um, what, are you, what materials are you allowed to have for this exam? We talked about orientation, see if you remember. An index card. Yeah, you get an index card and that's three by five. That's a three by five. You can write on both sides. The other thing you can bring with you if it helps is if, you, if it helps you to write on scratch paper, you can do that, but anything you do will not be part of the test. So you can't get credit for that, anything you write on that scratch paper. So I do recommend that you practice typing because unfortunately we're in, a, in this age where we have to be online. So everything's typed out. Larry, um, are we allowed to type our index card instead of handwriting it? You can do whatever you want with your index card as long as it's three inch by five inch, not three feet by five feet, by the way. Okay. <laughs> yep, as long as you're gonna show your index card to the screen. Okay. And as long as it's an index card and it's not gigantic, that's fine. On the final, you get a bigger one, by the way. You get a full, full paper, okay? And a three by five should be enough to be able to put all the information you need, you know, all the formulas that you need. Wait, but you can have scratch paper, but- Scratch paper or blank paper when you're starting the test. Oh, so you can work on- Yeah, material. just in case, like if you wanna draw some pictures of the uniform distribution. But the like three that. by five is notes that you've made previously. Yeah. Yeah, okay, three by five things, things that you'll want in the three by five, for example, would be the standard deviation for the uniform distribution. You probably don't have to memorize that. Do you agree? Okay, some of you might want a z-score formula. Some, you know, so whatever, whatever you want to put on there so you don't have to do any memorization. This is not a test about memorization. Sound fair? Okay, now comes the questions. <laughs> questions two through seven are two false questions, okay? And they could come from any of the concepts we've had, but they're two false. And because they're two false, um, they're actually Canvas graded because I trust the computer to see whether you did true or false, right? <laughs> Sound fair? Okay, so that's two through seven are two false questions. And they are uh, concept questions. So a lot of vocabulary. So you have to understand whether the vocabulary is the right, used in the right way. So there's a lot of that, okay? Um, eight through 10, there are, there are standard vocabulary and concept questions. So that could be, you know, which of the following charts is this or what kind of sampling technique is this kind of thing or, you know, and, and then it'll give you all the list of all the different ones and you got to pick the right one. Does that make sense? Okay, or it could be what's the, what, what could be a, you know, a first quartile for this picture? And it gives you five choices and only one of them is reasonable. So those are the kind of things it could give you. Any questions on what to expect there? So those will all be multiple choice? Yeah, so two through 10 are multiple choice. Okay, thank you. I mean, two through seven is multiple choice, but it's true, false, multiple choice. And then eight, nine, and 10 are a lot more choices. That make sense? Yes, thank you. Okay, number 11. And I wanna let you know also, this is important, not all questions are worth the same number of points. So the true falses are worth a lot less points than say question number 11. 
So these individual ones are worth a lot more because basically I basically one question has two falses with lots of parts, but Canvas doesn't let me do that very well. So it's a lot easier to just make them individual questions. Okay, so make sure that you don't skip any of these later ones. Okay, question 11 is finding and using statistics. Okay, so you should know how to get statistics out of a calculator. And all calculators, anytime you need a calculator, it'll be embedded in the problem. Okay, so I tried to make it really easy. Okay, so you're gonna have to find and use statistics. And we've had lots of statistics. We've had the mean, the median, the mode, the minimum, the maximum, the standard deviation, first quartile, third quartile, okay, z-score. So we've had a lot of different statistics. So I'm not gonna tell you which one or ones, but you're gonna have to get them. Question 12 is a probability question. That'll either come from chapter three or chapter four. Okay. Number 13 is understanding charts and statistics. So I'm gonna show you a chart, okay? And I'm not gonna tell you right now what kind of chart, but it's gonna be one of the charts that you're responsible for understanding. And from the chart, you should be able to read it and answer questions about it. And you should you know, know what it says. You should understand um, what statistics might be from that chart that type of thing. Question 14 is probability questions, bunch of parts. So that's the, again, three, chapter three or four. Okay, and when I say four, I mean binomial. When I say three, that's like um, ands, ors, givens, straight probabilities, uh, independent, mutually exclusive, oh. all those things. That was chapter three. Okay, problem 15 is an expected value and standard deviation question. What's a good way to practice for that? And to get examples. Any ideas? Okay. Go back. It's okay, but there's better and that's the discussion board from that week. So we had, a, we, we, we had a discussion board problem where you had to do a standard deviation and expected value. Okay, and look at look what you did, see what you did wrong, make sure what you did wrong doesn't happen again. Got it? Okay. Um, number 16 is a uniform distribution question. So that's a, you know, a probability and, or it could, I could be giving you a probability or percentile quartile and you have to find a value. You should know the, um, the mean and standard deviation for uniform distributions and how to use that. Number 17, that's a normal distribution question. And that is from um, last week. Okay, so Again, know how to, you know, understand the low and the high and, and the mean and standard deviation, the probability, and I could, you know, give you all but one and you got to figure out the rest, the, the last one. And number 18, I actually give in all the classes I teach. And this is always on the first exam. It won't be on the second exam. And this is extra credit. And that is write down one thing your instructor can do to make the class better and one thing that you feel that the instructor should continue doing. Any constructive remarks will be worth full credit. And by the way, um, I wanna let you know that the points that it says is not, the, is not gonna be what the two points are all about. So I made it the minimal number of points and I'm gonna decide at the end how many points it should be, okay? And if you don't do it, you don't lose points, but you don't get free points. Okay, and you might get 20 free points, who knows? So strongly recommend doing the extra credit because if, you've, you, if you write some suggestion, then, then you get full credit on it, okay? It's, all, it's an all or nothing question. 
What do you mean you decide at the end? Like almost you use that to scale it? Yeah. Yeah, so that's kind of how I curved the grade for the first grade, for the first class, the first test. So if you don't do it, then you don't get the extra bonus points that help curve it. <laughs> so do it. <laughs> you know, if you run out of time, jump to number 18, because that's a quick and easy one. Three points. Any questions on what to expect on this exam? Okay, just a note. Let me set it, here we go. Um, this is the course. And if we go, if you wanted to, you know, practice, I don't know, some probability questions, you can always go back to week two and you can click on um, the assignments. You can click on chapter three probability and you can practice. And you won't lose points if you make mistakes, you won't gain points, but you'll gain knowledge. You can also um, look at the comparing charts example and do some practice that way too, the discussion board. And you can do that with any of the things we've done in the class. Those are all still available then? Yeah. Yeah, they're all still available, not to get points on, but to practice. That makes sense? So you can still look and see, okay? And you can all go to your grade book and see how you did too. So that's, um, just to let you know, um, when you're taking the test, I'm not gonna be sitting there watching you, um, but a webcam is. And what'll happen is that if it, detects anything that's sketchy, it'll red flag it. Now it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that you cheated. So don't get all, if you like are talking to yourself and you're all worried about, you know, the fact that it red flagged you, um, that just means that I'm gonna be watching and I'm gonna see if you're just talking to yourself, then it's no big deal. And if, but if you're talking to someone else about it, that's a big deal, okay? Um, don't go looking at your smartphone. Smartphones need to be away from your computer um, because those are the kind of things that are cheating. So as long as you're not doing that stuff, even if it red flags you, it's no big deal. It's only if you're doing it wrong. Uh, where, are you, where will you be typing your work? Um, in Canvas. So let me, um, let me do the, I can't, I'm not sure if I can do Proctorio. Yeah, there's not much I can show you being, because I don't want to show you the test itself. And this is the first time we've had one of these. So you're, there's going to be a box. No. There's going to be a box and then you type your answer in the box under the question. And by the way, sometimes it's easier to copy and paste a question because there's a big space between the question and the box for a lot of these because the calculator's in the way. So if you want, you can copy and paste it into the box and then you can see it right in the box and then answer the question. In the actual Proctorio in page? In, in, in the Canvas page, yeah. So, right, you go to the left here where it says Proctorio and you click on that, or is it in this? Yeah. So, um, well, no, for the taking the test, which, you're, which is not open yet, then you click on the test. So if you go to the week, um, and there's a few ways of finding it. You can go to week five, and you'll see the exam, only take one of these, don't take three of them. And when you're ready to take it, you click it. Uh, and see? it can only be those times? Yeah, yeah, you're supposed to, you pick one of the times. I tried to make them varied, you know, an evening, a morning, a right mid, you know, a, a late morning, a Saturday, a Sunday, and a Thursday. I tried to pick a little of everything so that hopefully you can make one of the times. And you've known about this since, January 6th. Yeah, the box is very similar to the discussion box. It's the same buttons. Any other questions? I can answer a few more. I think I'm going to stop the share. Give show work, yes. So here's the thing about showing work. If you don't show work and you miss the problem just a tiny bit, you get a zero. But if you show work and you miss it a tiny bit, like you lost an egg of sign or something, you'll probably get nine out of 10 
or 14 out of 15. Do you see the difference? Show your work. Because I want to give you partial credit. And I give you zero partial credit if there's nothing to give you credit for. So sure. You mean the formula or the scratch paper that you're like writing on? You have to show that or? So you're going to be writing some explanations on what you did. Like I put it into the calculator and this is what I put. Does that make sense? Oh, I see. So it's not, I mean, now is, uh, there's some formulas that you, you may do, but there's not a whole lot of formulas in this class that you're responsible for. But so it would, and just explain what you're doing. And that way, if you have a typo when you put it in the calculator and you've explained what you did, you'll still get almost full credit. But if you don't explain what you did and you have a typo, you get a zero because I can't give you points for a wrong number if that's all I've got. Does that make sense? So you definitely want to show your work. On the true false, there's no work to show. That's all or nothing. But you know, the ones, the ones that are, you know written out problems. And some yet some I tell you to explain in a complete sentence and you have to do that. So for ones that the calculator does, as far as showing our work goes, would it be appropriate to say like, I put this much in the high box, this much in the low box, this exactly. was what I did here and I calculated for probability? Yeah. yeah, and I use this calculator, yeah. So if you're doing normal or or binomial, because there's calculators for that. You would say I use the normal or I use the binomial. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Yeah, there's not too much calculations other than the normal and binomial. A uniform has a little, and that you need to show your work on. And if you watch the webinars, show your work like I show work. Does that make sense? I'm sorry, you said primarily we'll be using what calculators? The ones that have been in the class the whole time, this one, let me show you again. Uh, sure. Not primarily, it's the only calculator you're allowed to use. But it's right. embedded on the test site. We don't have to go to- yeah, It's even better than the test site. It's in the problem itself. Okay, then, then we don't have to go okay. anywhere. You've even taken the guesswork out of which calculator we should be using. Yeah, that you have to know because you have to know which number. Oh, okay. See, every one that you have to use a calculator is going to have this right here that you're looking at now. Okay. Oh. And you're going to have to know which one to put. Do you see? Got it. But we've only gone to eight, correct? You won't use, yeah, if you use anything over eight, you screwed up yeah. <laughs> today. All right, all right, this week. <laughs> that means you screwed up. Okay. So it's one of the eight. And that's the kind of how you show your work. Just And you could even say calculator number eight if you don't want to type the whole word. If it's z-score, it's short, but, <laughs> and that's fine. You know, that's a, way, that's a way to show work. Does that make sense? You could say uh, number eight and I put in the low is this, the high is that, et cetera. Any questions on that? Okay, I think I wanna stop the share and, um, and the recording. <laughs>